I have collaborated with these two gentlemen for a long time. Never had a chance to come here. Uh, so I'm very happy to come here and tell you what has uh, kept me busy for a, more than a couple of decades now. But the idea has, has, has survived, which means that I hope that the science and the project will survive and will become real. Uh, what you're seeing here in the, in the first slide is the full talk that I can give, as somebody mentioned, for 45 minutes. But I do want you to only focus on certain things. This is all of you know, and when you enter a physics department of any uh, university, uh, you see this plot, starting from Big, big Bang, to quark gluon plasma, to, proton, to formation of protons and neutrons, uh, light nuclei, all the way to the current uh, status. And what I'm going to tell you today, the physics that I'll be talking about, the project that I'll be talking about, uh, will cover some aspects of the very early universe in the formation of protons and neutrons and try to understand how the properties of the protons and neutrons come about when the transition occurs from quark gluon to proton. That's something that we still don't understand, believe it or not. There are also people who have studied this phase called quark gluon plasma uh, here in your department and around uh, where you have collided two large nuclei and melted them to form this new medium called quark gluon plasma, and we are studying it in very different forms at RIC and LHC. But there is a new aspect of that has emerged, and I'll show you what this is, and this figure you don't need to know now, but it will appear. It predicts, if the QCD that we know today is right, it predicts a formation of a gluonic medium, a gluonic matter at extremely high energies in protons and nuclei uni universally. And something that we need to explore, we haven't had an experimental verification of that. That's something that we will do in the future experiments. And I'll talk about that too. So the physics that I will cover will touch, starting from these fundamental particles, the quarks and gluons, to the structure of the light nucleons, to the light nuclei, and how that relates to high heavy nuclei. And then also wonders, as to what happened in the formation of quark gluon plasma at that time, was there something else that was intriguing in the universe prevalent at that time? So that's the kind of thing that I will cover in this talk. Why do I do this? Because at the front of the, if you go to the nuclear physics webpage of the Department of Energy, it says the task of nuclear scientists is to probe nuclear matter in all its forms and exploring their potential for application. So these are the kind of forms of nuclei that we still don't understand at the very most fundamental level. And that's what I'm trying to tell you today, is there is something that is coming up that will allow us to explore that. So this is the electron ion collider, the next QCD frontier. The main task of this machine is to understand the glue that binds us all. What is the role of the uh, uh, glue that uh, seems to be at the center of QCD interactions? And what role does it play? in the QCD as we uh, know it. In particular, I would like to see the gluon separated from quarks inside a nucleon or a nucleus. You can think about it as looking through a filter that only allows you to see gluon uh, when you look at a nucleon, or only allows you to see a quark when you look at it uh, from another filter. So that's the kind of flavor I'm trying to bring to this talk. So I want to do the gluon imaging to understand the role of gluons in binding quarks and gluons into nucleons and nuclei. In that sense, I want to start with these fundamental particles and build the bridge to understanding the structure of the nucleon or nucleus. And it can be a very light nucleus or a very heavy one. So that's the big picture I want to cover in this talk. So let's start with the uh, fundamentals, the gluons in the standard model. Here are the quarks, the six quarks and their uh, anti-partners. Uh, the leptons, the Higgs boson, recently discovered, doesn't definitely exist. And these are the four forces that we know. And the particular one that we'll be focusing on today is the gluonic force. It's the carrier of strong force in the theory of QCD. It is chargeless, it's massless, but carries the color charge. Very distinctly different than a photon in that sense. It binds the quarks and gluons inside the hadrons with tremendous force, and that's why that tremendous force is the carrier of the strong part. 
It is at the heart of many un or ill understood phenomena, like the color confinement. Why do we not see colored quarks separated in nature? It doesn't understand. It, it's at, at the heart of what we call the nucleon spin puzzle. We didn't, still don't understand what is the composition and the contribution from quarks and gluons to the proton spin. We know it is made up of quarks and gluons, but if I give you a billion of them and say, build one and let me know how a proton is formed, I still won't be able to tell you that. That's an uh, open question for the last 40 years. And then quark gluon plasma at Rick and LHC has posed new ideas and new questions for us, and that we are exploring. Again, gluon is at, par, at, at, at the heart of all of this. Now, what is uh, special about QCD from QED? What distinguishes it? Well, QED is mediated by the photons, as we all know, which are charged less. QCD is mediated by gluons. They're also electrical charge less, but they have color as their charge. So they're colored, which means that in QCD and QED, you can have a photon or a, a, a gluon or a photon splitting into a quark, anti-quark, or electron, positron pair like that. That sort of a Feynman diagram exists. Whereas only these kind of interactions, I mean, can happen in QCD. You cannot have a photon going into splitting into another photon directly like at, at one square. So this is going to be at the heart of all the interactions and novelty about QCD that you will come across again and again in this talk. So remember this, this is only happening in QCD. And this is where a large number of gluons can be created from a few gluons that you can confine in a particular place. So that's what is happening inside protons and neutrons. The number of photons, uh, gluons can grow very, very large, and that's something that is special about QCD. And we'll come back to that later. The method of measurement that I'll be focusing on, and some of the semantics I'll be using in the talk, require me to tell you this up front. I'm going to use a method called deep inelastic scattering, a very special one in which you take an electron or a muon, which you know has no structure as far as we know. It's a point particle. And it is scatters off of a hadron or a nucleus, which is indicated here. There's a momentum exchange by a, virtue of a virtual photon, virtual just because we don't see it. But there is a scattering angle to the electron that tells me that something happened between them. And then you measure the final state electron energy and angle as best as you can using a detector. Because you're bringing the electron or the muon from a collider experiment or a fixed target experiment, you know precisely its energy up to about 1%, 0.1%. So the initial angle energy of the electron is known. And depending upon how much you spend on your detector, you know how well the electron and the angle, energy and the angle of the electron is. If you know those two things, you know exactly what happened in the collision of the photon and the quark. How do we know that? So the momentum exchange is simply a four vector quantity. You can see it based on initial and final energy on the angle of the electron. You can see that that comes out to be this. Initial energy of the electron, scattered energy, and the scattered angle. That's the Q squared. Momentum exchanged. The Q squared is also intimately related to the resolution with which you're looking inside the proton. Remember, h is equal to lambda y. Yes? Q is in the denominator with the Planck's constant in the numerator. So the scale, the length scale that you're measuring inside goes inversely as Q. That's the same Q squared. So if a Q squared is large, you're measuring a small distance. Then you can form other variables, which we call il inelasticity y, which is a four vector quantity like that. But you can solve it. And amazingly enough, it solves again for the scattered electron energy, initial energy, and the scattered electron angle. And then you form a something new, an x, which is the Burkean x, the momentum fraction of the quark that was hit by that photon. Quark was inside the proton. The momentum fraction of that quark compared to the total momentum of the proton in this initial uh, uh, infinite momentum frame, the measure of the fraction of the momentum comes out to be this. Again, every one of them is only simply an, a function of theta, e prime, and e. So just by looking at what happened to this electron, 
I'm telling you that I can know exactly how to calculate and know what happened in the collision. You can never do this in proton-proton collisions or nucleus-proton collisions or nucleus-nucleus collisions because you do not know the probing momentum of the proton that well because proton or the quark in the case of proton-proton you don't know what the momentum of the quark was. You have to look at the final state jets and derive what happened there. Here, I'm telling you, I know exactly what happened. This is the unique thing about deep inelastic scattering and brings the precision needed to go to the next level of QCD factory or QCD uh, machine that we want to go in the future. So electrons are crucial to this idea. All right. Then the cross sections for such things are very simply, I don't, you don't have to remember all these things are again, functions of this y, this is the F2 structure function that gives you information about the quark distribution, and there is something called F longitudinal which has the information about the gluon distribution function. I think I'm cutting off something at the bottom, I don't know. Huh? Ah, okay, very good, I'll, I'll use this one here. All right, but I want to focus on something else experimentally, very simply. When I measure E, P, or A goes to E prime X, X means I don't care about what's going on. That's the kind of process I just described to you here. I ignore everything else. Just look at the scatter. That's called the inclusive deep inelastic scattering. When I become a little bit more ambitious, I can look at the thrust axis of this photon and see what comes out in that direction. That's the fragmentation that goes in the direction of the photon, and that could come out here. And then I look at what happens there. I measure the scattered electron. That I need to know because that's the only way no, their collision actually happened. And then you thrust the quark out through the proton in this direction, then you become semi-inclusive physics measurement. But then you also ask, hey, what happened to the remnant? What happened to the target which remained as a fragment? And that's the final part of this. When you can actually measure all of this, it's called an exclusive event. And I will talk about inclusive and exclusive events in this. Of course, to measure exclusive events, you need more money to build the detector to make sure that everything that is created is measured. That's one thing. But exclusive events, you want to categorize the events into different parts, which means that you're splitting the data into smaller and smaller subgroups, which means that you need a very high luminosity. Proton, electron scattering, numbers. So those are the three things that you remember Luminosity goes this way, cost of the detector also goes that way. So that's the big picture. Okay, now let's start with the physics. If I ask you, what does the proton look like? What does the proton look like in transverse direction? Over the last 40, 50 years, there were different models of protons that have evolved. Now some of them are not necessarily correct anymore because of the information we know. But if I still wanted to ask you a question, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. That's the point I wanted to make. So here is a proton in the very, very old bag model where the gluon field is distributed wider than the fast moving quark. So if you were to measure what the gluon distribution was, if you could measure, then you would find on an average that the gluon radius of the proton is larger than the average quark radius because the quarks are in there, the gluons are surrounding it. Now, if I boosted that proton, that means I'm looking at smaller and smaller. The Q has now gone up. My resolution probe is high energy. So now I'm boosting the proton and looking at it from a very, very high resolution. And I start seeing subparts of that, which is shown in the right column. And you see that. And here is where you will start seeing that the average radius of gluon distribution would be larger than the quark radius. Now, if instead you looked at the constituent quark model, which looks more like that, there are quarks centering and surrounding our dressed gluons around them inside the proton. And now I look at that with a high resolution probe at high energy, I would find that wherever there's a quark, there's a gluon on an average. So on an average, you will find that the quark the color radius and the quark radius, the electric radius is the same. And now in the more modern lattice gauge theory idea, concepts, you have these three sort of points of, of quark, 
and they are connected via gluons that look like that. And now you look at it again in the transverse dimension and try to resolve, re resolve it. And here, in this case, on an average, you will find that the gluon radius is smaller than the quark radius. These are simple things. Can we do such experiments? Can we actually resolve this? Well, we don't know because we've never seen transverse images of the proton with the quark or the gluon filter. We've never done that. The best we know is this from Hera. That's the longitudinal structure X, and that's the momentum fraction, and this is some fragmenta uh, the, the, the parton distribution function. And all we know is this. This is the best knowledge we have. It is only in the direction of the proton's movement that we know the information. How many gluons are there with certain momentum fraction? 0.5. How many are there when it is 0.25? How many are there when it is 0 0.025? That plot is very precise, and that's all we needed so far, because we did not think in high energy collisions the transverse dimension was important. When the proton is moving this way, that's all that counted. Feynman told us, and we had no reason to question him. So all this was developed this way. On the right hand side, is a similar plot, but made for spin structure function. Again, we only know the longitudinal structures. We don't know how to answer that question asked you. What is the transverse spin, a transverse structure of the proton, if I look at it as a proton coming at you? OK, we need to go beyond that one dimension. We need to create these two plus one dimensional images of quarks and gluons in nuclei and position and momentum space, because I will tell you why those two are important. Obviously. OK, I'll keep, this is a secret. I'll, I'll come back to that a little later. Anyway, this is the first time, if at all we can do it, we'll be seeing it. And this is terra incognita, high potential for discovery, really looking at the proton from a different angle. Let me ask another question now. Switch gears. What does the proton look like at low and high energy? So here is my cartoon of a low energy proton in a fixed target experiment. Three dominant quarks are the ones that are prominent, you know, giving it properties. And this is my time axis. And here is the time. Quark remains that way. There are some uh, excitations of gluons and exchanges. And I perform an experiment, which is like taking a picture. And that blue thing is a picture that I take. Between those two, I have taken the picture. So if I ask, if you ask me, what does a proton look like? Ah, my answer would be, oh, it has these three quarks. And I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 gluons in them. That's my proton. That's how I would say it if I did the experiment. Now if I do it at the collider. Now here is my cartoon of a accelerated proton, Lorentz contracted. And now here, again, the three quarks are important. However, these fluctuations that I had seen are time dilated in the strong interaction time scales. If they're time dilated, that means they live a little bit longer than they were in the fixed target experiment, or fixed proton, which means the gluon has more time to split more into gluon. Remember, they are charged particles. So they charge, color charge. So they will split more, and they will split more, and they will split more. So typically, long-lived gluons radiate further small x, small fraction. They have to conserve the momentum and the energy. That means that each additional two extra gluons that will come will have less energy than the previous one, but the number density changes, and it increases. And they will split again, and they'll split again. This keeps on happening, leading to a runaway growth. Where do we see that in nature? Well, in fact, that runaway growth was mentioned in the Nobel lecture from, uh, by Frank Wilczek in 2004. The result is a self-catalyzing enhancement that leads to a runaway growth. A small color charge in isolation builds a big color thundercloud. This was written down. This is a natural property of QCD. It should happen. Why don't we see it happen? Well, we don't see it happen. We, don't, we haven't dealt with gluons in our experiment. But we actually see this. It's not hidden from us. Well, here it is. It's the same plot that I showed you before of parton distribution functions from Hera, except in this case, I have taken out a fraction, a 0.5% fraction multiplying that curve to put this curve in comparison with that. I had reduced it by a factor of 20. If I take it out, 
the gluon looks like that. It keeps on going almost infinitely, all the way to a momentum fraction of 0 0.0001. It keeps on going. What is the origin of such a rise that seems to be going infinity? That is the growth that we'll check and the QCD tells us happens in QCD. Number of gluons increases as a function of higher and higher energy. And that's what is exactly happening here. The gluon splitting into two, those two for the split, for the split, for the split. However, this cannot go on forever. There has to be a limit. What is that limit? And why is there a limit? Well, we know that the high energy cross sections have to be, have to be finite. We have measured them. The question is, what will do that, that, that thing that will make this go, not keep on going this way, but maybe saturate? Where does that happen? We haven't seen that. But the mechanism to do that already is built in to the QCD. When you have large number of colored gluons in the vicinity inside a finite proton, the probability that the two gluons will merge into one another to reduce the number of gluons also increases. So as a function, because the volume is fixed, the number of gluons increase. At some point, they start decreasing because they start merging. And at some point, this and that start becoming equal. And that's the point where you expect to see this saturation. And it's a fascinating aspect of QCD that it self-controls and becomes saturated. Where that happens, we, don't, we still haven't seen. We haven't known explicitly. This is something that we need to figure out. But people have been, theorists have been clever to figure out what would that kind of a medium look like? Because you're in the deep low X region, quarks are non-important, it's purely gluonic in nature. And now people have calculated what the properties are. And based on those properties, they have named it color glass condensate. Color because it comes from color charges, color interactions. Condensate because they're spin one, large number of gluons, like an atomic physics condensate or a condensed matter condensate. And glassy because the interactions seem to be only happening over large distances within the nuclei. So it's a collective behavior of all the gluons together. Emergent collective behavior. I think condensed matter physicists are familiar with these words. We are first time using them in QCD. So in a way, we are actually looking at a condensed matter system in the QCD for the first time to see its study. So that's what we are trying to do in, in one aspect of the science of EIC. These nonlinear structures, that, this growth uh, of gluons, have very significant con uh, 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 consequences. The color confinement is a consequence of gluon self-interaction. Somehow these interactions build the boundary of the proton, unique property of strong interactions, the self-governing. The quark-gluon interactions, of, they have confined motion of quarks and gluons. We call them transverse momentum parton distribution functions, or TMDs, in our nuclear physics world. Those are something that we need to, we know they exist, we have measured transverse momentum, how they correlate to the motion of quarks and gluons, and their interaction is something that we don't understand. Confined spatial correlation of quarks and gluons. How are they distributed? They are called generalized parton distribution functions. Those are things that we call in nuclear science, but it's really a position dependence. And this is why I was telling the position and momentum distribution correlated one that gives you a full three-dimensional picture of the proton. And then the ultra rense gluon fields, which I just mentioned to you. Is it a universal thing? Can I take the proton to higher energy and see the same thing? Can I take something else to high energy? It shouldn't be different at very, very high energy. Like, take it to you know, ultra LHC energy. Why would a proton know, or the quark inside a proton know, that it is not part of a nucleus, of a larger nucleus? There is no, everywhere it sees around, it will see very large number of quarks and gluons. So there is no way it should be different for protons and nuclei. And that's the universality argument that people have said. So this emergent dynamics in QCD is so important. Without gluons, there would be no nucleons, no atomic nuclei, and no visible world. Remember, it's the massless gluons and almost massless quarks through their interactions generate the mass of the nucleon. In all APS charts of physics, they say mass generation comes from Higgs. It is true. It is the mass of the light quark or the quarks that come from Higgs. In nature, the visible matter, most of the mass, 95% of the mass, 
comes from these gluon interactions. They carry about 50% of the momentum of the proton and a very significant fraction of nucleon spin. I'll show you that a little bit later. And they're essential for the dynamics of confined particles. Pro properties of the hadrons are emergent phenomena resulting not only from the equation of motion, but also they are very tied, uh, intricately tied to the QCD vacuum. And there are examples of that besides confinement, such as spontaneous symmetry breaking and various anomalies in, in QCD. And last but not the least, nucleon nucleus forces emerge from quark gluon interactions. What is the partonic origin of what we people have understood over 40 years as being nucleon binding is not quite clear. Yeah? We, we don't know the partonic origin of that. We say there are pion exchanges, and people just believe that that's what it is. It is true. But why is there a pion sitting between uh, two neutrons inside a nucleus? What is the partonic origin of that? It's something that we will try to understand through various experiments in the future. So the experimental insight and guidance is crucial to complete our understanding of hadrons and nuclei, starting from the quarks and gluons. And that is why we want to do something. So all these things that I mentioned to you are somehow connected to specific experimental questions that I mentioned to you. So all the time that I talked about very high level understanding of QCD, they can be submerged into six of these questions on three different topics. One is, how do C quarks and gluons and their spins distributed in space and momentum inside a nucleon? How do the nucleon properties emerge from them and their interactions? Just 30 years ago, when I was a graduate student, we did not know that the quarks do not contribute too much to the proton spin. We thought they all came in line, and that's how you get the proton spin. Three quarks, spin half, one, 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 that's it. You get three half. And people believe that. You can calculate things about the proton which match, except when we experimentally measured it. In fact, oh, one of your collaborators was all, also on the original experiment in the EMC that they measured this is where the, uh, created the nucleon spin crisis. How do color charged gluons and colored light jets interact with the nuclear medium? How do confined hadronic states emerge from quarks and gluons? And how do quark gluon interaction create nuclear binding? Here is my deep inner axis scattering cartoon. Electron comes in, scatters, this photon is created. That goes inside, hits a parton inside a proton inside a nucleus. And that kicked parton then travels through the cold QCD medium of a nucleus. And at some point, it magically knows to pick up antiquarks around it and form a pion that you see in nature. That's what we see in the detector. How does it happen? What happens in this phase here? The electron ion collider if you can control the photon energy as well as the size of the nucleus, I will have a lot of answers to this. A lot of experimental input can go in. We have never done such an experiment in the past, except for a fixed target experiment, again, done by the same person in the EMC era. How do dense nuclear environments affect quarks and gluons? What does happen to the parton distributions in nuclei? Are they the same? Well, we know. That's called the EMC effect. Same again. So you have a strong connection to this department, actually. What happens to gluon density in nuclei at extremely high energy? Does it saturate, which I told you about this physics here? So those are the high-level questions. I will pick only two of them to demonstrate and see what happens in the nucleus. But before I go to that, let me just show you a, general, a generalization. Here is the parton density on the x-axis. It's related to 1 over x that we have been talking about. And here is the resolution. The hadron structures sit here at low parton density and in non-perturbative regime of QCD. And then you start going in that direction, that direction, that direction. What people call formerons and regions, they sit in this region where the parton density is high, but we are in the non-perturbative regime. We don't quite know how to calculate those things. However, at some point, we make a transition from non-perturbative to perturbative, from strong coupling to weak coupling, and suddenly we can start doing calculations. At extremely high resolution, we hear things are very clear. We know how to do perturbative QCD calculations very, very clearly. In this region intermediate, you will need to explore new correlations. Nobody has really looked at this with the kind of precision and, and flexibility that this future collider is going to give you. And then it opens up a window of high-density gluonic matter 
which sits in the weak coupling regime, not in the strong coupling regime. That's fascinating. You're looking at the strong force, the gluon, the, the strongest binding force we know, and it seems to form a medium which is weakly coupled. So it's very unintuitive, but it comes out of clear calculations of perturbative QCD, and we have never seen it. So we need to explore that region. Experimentally, never has been explored. We now know how to do that. So now to the experimental part. So we have currently two types, two proposals on the table to build this electron ion collider. Here is one at RIC. We call it ERIC. Here is the blue and the yellow ring of the RIC. They already exist functional. We have been using it for the last 20 years. To that, we will add a red beam here shown as electron ring in the same tunnel with the source sitting right here and could collide with either the, the yellow or the blue ring, depending upon which direction it goes, either in this experimental area where we had Phoenix detector here or in this experimental area or both. This is the star detector which is currently existing. So we can use the tunnel. You can use one of the rings. Just add the electron ring and then the everything else remains the same. The other competing proposal is the existing 12G VCBAC at Jefferson Lab in Newport News. To that, they would want to add a bow tie shaped collider facility, greenfield facility, to collide the electron extracted from the JLab 12GV and then build a new collider ring here. The reason why they have a bow tie and we have a ring, we can talk about accelerator science a little later. Somebody asked me a question, I'll show you why it is. But there are differences. They're not to scale, of course, but they're compatible, compatible in the scientific output. What we're looking for is polarized electron, proton, deuteron, and helium beams. We're looking at electron beam energy somewhere between 5 and 20 GeV. We're looking at luminosities, EP luminosities of 10 to the 33 and 34 per centimeter square per second, which is about 100 to 1,000 times the previous experimental EP scattering experiments done at HERA, at DAISY. And we want to have this collider with variable center of mass energy. We want to move from one center of mass energy to the other to study how the QCD structures change and dynamics changes as a function of center of mass energy. Because some of these questions will not be obvious only sitting at one. And if you look at all the colliders that were built in the world so far, there are not too many of them that can run at multiple energies without losing significant fraction of their luminosity. RIC is one of the special ones that was built that way. The magnets were built that way. We want to keep that facility on and use that, uh, th that aspect of it. When built, it will be the first polarized electron, polarized light ion collider. It will also be the first and the only electron nucleus collider. And both proposals use the significant uh, uh, investments that Department of Energy has already made. How special will it be? Here is a plot of center of mass energy versus luminosity of all fixed target and future and past experimental facilities in the world. These are the existing and the past experimental facilities at CBAP, at Newport News, at SLAC, at CERN experiments here, EMC, NMC sitting here, Zeus and H1 at HERA, and these are the future collider experiments that are being planned in the future in China and wherever else, and CERN. If you ask for high luminosity and wide center of mass energy, change the center of mass energy, then you suddenly lose all the fixed target experiments. These experiments don't have that facility now, but if, in, if required, they could probably implement it in the future. But then if you ask for polarized leptons and hadron beams and nuclei, you can see this is the only one that survives. So this is really a unique thing. It's a challenge to accelerator science because you want to build all these things into one facility and run it at high luminosity. So a rather unique place to do experiments in the future. Uh, uh. So let me go into the physics of this now. I'll take two examples. Here is the first example, the nucleon spin. It's an emergent phenomena that comes from quark's contribution to nucleon spin. We know that the proton spin is half. Yeah, Proton spin is half, we know for sure. There's no, no uncertainty about it. And it has to come from quarks and gluons. So people thought it was the alignment of the quarks that was responsible for it. We now know it's about 25% plus minus 3% contribution that comes from the quarks. 
We have measured over the last decade the contribution from the gluon distribution. We have come to about 25 percent plus minus about 5 to 10 percent experimental uncertainties. But there are regions of X that we have never looked at. So the very, very low X region, which contributes to the where the gluons are high, we don't know, we have never measured it. So we need to measure that in the future with the electron ion collider. Currently, if you take the uncertainties from that, you get a number that looks more like this or even larger. It's really a number that says it's not zero, but maybe, maybe. We have to make a more precise measurement. And then, of course, if these numbers stand out, then there has to be some other contribution that has to be coming from the orbital motion of quarks and gluons. How do we measure that is a question. We'll come back to that. Now, the prospect of precision measurements on this side has recently triggered activities on the lattice QCD that now are trying to calculate gluons' contribution to nucleon spin or parton distribution themselves from scratch, which is the right thing to do from the QCD side. In 10 years, they will be ready. We will be ready. Hopefully, we can compare directly the, with lattice QCD. That would be the great uh, uh, thing at that point. So with those uncertainties, we start. If we take this and we perform an experiment at this EIC, so here is the thing that we are trying to do. Here is the quark contribution to proton spin. This is this part here. Here is the gluon's contribution to proton spin. That's this part here. And if you do the experiment, to measure these, this is the uncertainty. This is current uncertainty. I've blown it up a little bit to show you what the blue, uh, this is three sigma uncertainty which is shown here. And then with the experiments done at 5, 100, or 250, because you go to the lower values of x, which the uncertainty is very, very large, you can see this. This is the x. Here are the uncertainties. You can get rid of those uncertainties by going to this value. And that's what collapses these uncertainties to this red number here. And the same thing for anti-quarks. So really, you go from a 50 to 100 percent uncertainty on these options to about 10 to 5 percent uncertainty. And this will then become comparable to the, to, to the calculations that might exist in, in the time there. But you might ask, I told you that I, we have to go significantly be beyond what we can do today. I just showed you what we can do with the known methods of calculating or getting to the quarks and gluons. What can I do better? So here is a cartoon. This is really, if I show you this, you know it's a, it's a human being. But we know that's the proton today. That's the, the, like the, what we know of protons. We know the real first thing that we are going after is a three-dimensional object. So from here to there, we have to go somehow. For that, we need the electron scatter. And the example that I'm going to show you is that if I give you a homework of doing understanding the structure of a watermelon, what's inside a watermelon? You can do many different ways. And here's my first experiment that we have done so far. We've taken two watermelons and collided them on a few. That's what we do at RIC. That's what you do at LHC. And you know, you see what's inside. Yes? So you will see meat and, and, and seeds. But then you ask, whoa. Where were the seeds located? What was the position distribution of those seeds inside the watermelon? Well, I can't tell you this week. I, I, I broke it. OK, well, you have to do this next experiment. You want to do an experiment with a probe which cannot be broken. A probe, in this case, is a knife. A knife, you can cut the watermelon as you want it. And here is a person cutting the watermelon. See that? Now I can show you, just take a slice. And I know now the structure of the seeds. But now it gets really weird. Suppose I tell you, just for the hypothetical case, that watermelon was alive. And there was actually some motion in there. And you don't want to kill the watermelon, but still see the internal structure. What would you do? You would take an MRI. I don't know why, but if you look at the web, you can find an MRI of a watermelon. <laughs> so here it is. It's not alive, but it is a watermelon MRI. I told you I want to measure the orbital motion of quarks and gluons inside a proton. I cannot destroy it by doing deep inelastic scattering. Yes, I cannot do that. I cannot hit it against each other. I cannot cut it with an electron. I have to do something very, very soft to it. I have to respect its integrity, it still looks inside. So I have to do an MRI of the proton. 
And now we know how to do that. And that's coming up now. So if I have these data, I can put it all together in a formalism that has something called a Wigner function, has the x momentum fraction, the transverse distance of the parton from the center, assumed center of the proton, and kt, the transverse momentum of the parton itself. Those are the three things that we need to know, the kt, the distance from the center, and the z directional momentum. If I know about all the partons of that, I know the entire three-dimensional structure of the proton. Now, I can't measure it, unfortunately, because experimentally, they will take me into regions of phase space which will be extremely difficult to measure. However, I can do better if I have a collider than a fixed target experiment, and I still don't have a collider. So I actually can design the experiment to get to the maximum range in x, q squared, and these variables. So that's what we are doing now. So if I look at only, you integrate over the transverse momentum space, what you get is the momentum distribution, which I mentioned to you, the TMDs, the transverse momentum distribution. We have measured them now with E plus E minus, I'm oh, sorry, E plus P or PP scattering. Transverse momentum distribution of the, of the quarks inside protons is easy to measure. How do we measure it? We take a proton, we take a polarized electron, or take a polarized proton, polarized proton, we hit it, and we see pi ions going one way, pi minuses going that way. Pi pluses go one way, and pi minuses go that way. The leading part, dominant quark of the pi pluses, pi minus, we know, we know that the parton was moving in one direction, and we see the asymmetry. Experimentally, is very well known. So we can deduce the TMDs, but how do we use them was not known. This formalism has emerged now. If you go in the coordinate space, there's something called the GPDs, so if you measure the coordinate space distribution, and that tells you something about the position space distribution, you integrate over the KT. And if you know the TMDs and GPDs simultaneously, which now we know, I'll show you how to measure them, then we can put all this together and form ideas about the orbital angular momentum of quarks and gluons. So that's a simple idea, it's a very, measure the momentum, we measure the position, we measure them simultaneously in the sense of you measure them at a certain values of x and q squared, and they put the whole picture together. Make a slices as a function of x over wide range and make that measurement. And I think we can understand that if you know the position and momentum at a certain uh, kinematic uh, uh, variable, you know the orbital motion of those quarks and gluons at that orbital. And then you control and move away from that position and measure it again and again and fill, really fill up the, 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 the slices as if you're doing the MRI of the proton. And I'll show you some of the simulation studies later. So here is the simulation study of the generalized parton distribution function. Why do I have Mahatma Gandhi on it? Oh, here it is. I told you, if you want to look inside the proton and not disturb the, 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 the orbital motion of the quarks and gluons, you cannot break it. Those kind of collisions were initially in which the proton hit proton and broke it, were called the violent collisions. So if you don't want to hit the protons, and or you, or if you don't want to break the protons, they have to be called the non-violent collisions. And then growing up in India, non-violent collisions have to be Gandhian collisions. So that's why I correlate that with Gandhian collisions. What are they? They are in technical words called deeply virtual Compton scattering. We discovered them at HERA in 1996 to 2002. What happens in such a collision? We have a proton beam, and we have an electron beam that has come in, emits a photon that converts into a quark-antiquark -quark pair, and the proton remains intact. That quark gets connected to this, inside the quark here. Then that is excited quark, radiates the photon, and falls back again. Yeah? So there's a quark inside the proton, sees my virtual photon, gets excited, but then gets de-excited, releasing a real photon. That quark remains inside the proton. That means the proton remains intact. We didn't know such an event existed until 1996, and we have measured them. We saw small deviations in proton direction in the very, very forward region. We saw a direct photon coming out, and we saw the scattered electron that told us something had happened. So EP goes to E prime, P prime, and a real photon. 
is a clear signature of something called the deeply virtual Compton scattering. And as you can see, this is connected to the quark distribution, and that tells you the spatial distribution, talks about the spatial distribution of the quarks. There is another thing that we saw in the same experiment, Zeus and H1, in which we finally saw, in the final state, we saw vector mesons, like jape size and rows, and everything else remaining the same. Electron comes through, photon, gluon, gluon comes out, interacts with this, goes back in, proton remains intact, and a vector meson is produ produced. These are the Feynman diagrams that were being written down as we did the experiments without us knowing that. Theorists were speculating that they should exist. They were calculating the rates. We found them between those five years. And those are directly connected. So if you check, if you look at the change in the momentum of the initial state to the final state protons, it's a T distribution. And if you take the Fourier transform of a transverse momentum distribution of the scattered protons, it tells you what was the shape of the object from which the scattering was occurring. It's like your diffracting process. You look at the transverse momentum and you do something about the shape of the, of the diffracting uh, 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 medium. Here's a proton, which is not breaking. It's an exclusive measurement, very similar to diffraction. But that's what really was happening, and that's what we measured. And with this, now people have made much progress. We've measured them. We've looked at the angular distribution over the last 10, 15 years, and we know how to handle that now. So with polarized protons, we can actually see this. So these exclusive measurements measure everything. That's the difficult part. But once we do that, we start getting simulation. Well, this is simulation pictures. We have no idea what it might look like. But this is the momentum distribution of u quarks in the x direction, y distribution of the u quark and the d quark. And you see this is a polarized proton. We have a asymmetry in the average momentum of the u quark, asymmetry in the other direction of the average momentum of the d quark. This is simply momentum distribution. But you can start looking at them over a very wide range in x, and you see how that evolves as a function of energy. This is 1 over x is the energy. This is point, this is 1. This is point uh, zero zero 001. And you see how the transverse momentum, how does the proton evolve as a function? The quarks evolve as a function of energy inside the proton without breaking them. On the right-hand side are the C quarks position distribution. You can see there is a clear distinguish, distinguishing feature of unpolarized versus polarized proton. There's a physical movement of this. You expect that to happen because they're correlated with the momentum. If the momentum shifts, then the position shifts. And that's, is it RB sensitive on an on a experimental basis with the electron proton? And not only that, we can see the evolution of this gluon radius. This is femtometers 1.2. And you can see the edges are very clear. And you can start seeing where does the proton end if you look at it from the gluon's perspective uh, uh, filter. That's what I meant by saying you look at what is the end of the distribution of the glue? What are the end of the distribution of the quarks? We can make these measurements and compare them. And that's what we will try to do. And that's what we are hoping to do. Let me quickly go through the uh, aspects of some of the important nuclei uh, when you use nuclei in the laboratory. I think I mentioned to you before, precision of this comes from the energy of this photon, nu Q squared by 2 mx, whereas m is the mass of this, of this parton inside there. And you can kick one single out, and you see how it evolves and then converts into a photon, uh, a, a hadron. And you can control if this was happening earlier by changing the size of the nuclear, uh, the size, and compare how the hadronization happens as the size of the nuclear medium just simply by changing the nucleus. You can com control this one very precisely as well, or a very, very wide range in nu. You can control that. So that's something that will be very, very unique with the nuclear uh, 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 experiment, where we use is as a femtometer size filter for QCD studies, uh, as nobody has, has, has ever done before. And you realize that this fragmentation of quarks into the hadron is really connected to the color confinement, because that's where it is colored. And suddenly, at some point, it becomes this color, or neutralized. How does that happen? Where does that happen? What are the mechanisms for it? Those are the things that we will have to ask once we have all the data in hand. And then, as I mentioned to you, that the gluon distribution, which keeps on rising, how do we have experimental signatures of that? So I'm going to show you a couple of them. 
So here is what is happening. This is the one over energy axis. This is the x-axis. This is the resolution axis. This is the non-perturbative regime. We want to keep away from it. We want to be in the perturbative regime where the coupling is weak. And normal people who have done QCD studies at various colliders, people do ultra really Parisi equations. You give me a parton distribution at a particular resolution scale, I can evolve it high or low using ultra really Parisi evolution equations. However, it's non-trivial to go from in, the, in this direction, in the x direction, to go from a lightly, uh, sparsely populated proton in that direction, going to lower and lower values of x. This is where the transition is expected to happen. And we are expecting to see that QS, where does that change place? So that's what I want to measure. And I want to understand it. And this is what I'm expecting to see. At some point, this becomes equal to that. And this is the sig signature of it. It's a collective gluonic system that happens here. Is it universal? It does it have the properties of what have been written down in various theory papers as color glass condensate? We don't know whether that is correct or not. Something new has to happen. Is it this? We don't know yet. But this is the prediction currently we have. And people can calculate it separately, but this is what, what, what comes out to be. So then you might ask, hey, but Hera has done these experiments at much higher energy. People are talking about much higher energy. Why haven't they seen it? Well, they were doing it with a proton. And the nucleus has a very distinct advantage. Here is my nucleus. When it is boosted at high energy, it is now Lorentz contracted. And I'm exploring all the partons coherently using the high energy probe. And that gives me an oomph factor which is connected to the size of the nucleus, a to the power 1 third divided by the x at which I'm measuring it. So it's really a oomph factor that I'm, I'm relying on. And here is my oomph factor. The proton energy goes up by moving from proton to, uh, or this curve goes up when go from proton to the nucleus. This is uh, uh, gold, this is calcium, and this can be even further. So what we are trying to do is to things that happen in the proton at 10 to the minus 5 in x suddenly start happening at 10 to the minus 3 in, in a gold collision. Why does that happen? Simply to think about it is that the gold has a tremendously high packing factor of partons. So you now you're not looking for higher energy per se. You are looking for higher parton density. And nature gives us in a heavy nucleus a huge parton density. If you condense it as a nucleus, you can actually use it effectively. The higher the energy, better. And that's what we are trying to do. And that's what we hope we can do this with. So this is the x fraction. This is the resolution fraction. And below that, between them, now added the atomic number, which is right here. So we want to study if it is really true that we can create such a unique medium, which is very, very glassy and very gluonic, that sits between the parton gas system and the regular confined region. And basically, we're trying to save money by going to nuclei, instead of trying to build a LHC based electron proton scattering or even beyond where we may need it but currently we don't think we need it what would be the signatures well i'm telling you that two so this is a dihedron correlation uh, signal where electron a nucleus uh, uh, collide a scattered electron is created and two hadrons are created and you look at the angular distribution of, between them and you see that if that unique gluonic medium is actually created the other hadron will be suppressed because it will try to go through the other the, the nuclear medium, the gluonic medium, and it will not be able to pass through. And here is the difference between various saturation and non-saturation models, or uh, uh, models where there is this, this saturation is this gluon, the red one here. The ones without it are at, 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 uh, at this black and empty spots uh, in the nuclei without saturation. And the open dots, which are absolutely not visible, but meant to em emphasize that if you did the experiment with EP and with no saturation, then you would see the same result, no matter where in center of mass energy you would see it. So this is a recent result that we saw. The second one, which I like very, very much, is about the gluon. I'm telling you that there is a gluon that is making the difference. The gluon has to saturate. Then I look for a process in which gluon comes very dominantly, and that's the diffraction process. It is important because it has a gluon squared. 
Everything else, you just measure the gluon distribution. Here, you actually square it. So anything that happens to gluon will happen very, very strongly in the gluon squared. So the importance of this is, is interesting to see. We expected at HERA on EP scattering about 0.1% or 1% of diffractive events. What is a diffractive event for those who are not clear as to why that is so important? You have a proton at 800 GeV or 900 GeV at HERA, and we have a 30 GeV electron. So in the proton thrust frame, you have a multi-TV electron hitting it. A multi-TV electron hitting a proton that is bound with bounding energy of, of, of MeV. We expect it 0.1% of the time when proton does not get destroyed. What we found instead was 15% of the time, 10 to 15% of the time, the proton remained intact. We saw it. That was a big surprise. People who believe these calculations of colored glass condensate could explain that effect. There were others who could explain that effect too. You see, 15% of the time, the proton does not get destroyed. Now, the prediction is that if you replace the nucleus, because you have a lot more gluons in them, you are forming a gluon wall, a gluonic wall. And you will have a lot more diffraction. And the calculations tell us that there will be about 30 to 40 percent. 30 percent of the time, the nucleus will not get destroyed. Again, a multi-TV electron hits the nucleus. Yeah, I smiled too when I first heard it. But that's what it is expected. There is no wiggle room for that. And the idea is very simple. What happens in a diffraction? You have a opaque disk of cardboard. You shine light, monochromatic light, and you see these diffractive patterns. Everyone remembers this, undergraduate physics. A disk or an edge, you see the diffractive pattern. We are actually expecting to see diffraction, the same diffraction. But now it's a virtual photon coming in. Nucleus is my disk, and I'm going to see those diffractive patterns. Believe it or not, at star experiment at RIC, we have actually seen PA collision and we can start seeing the first diffraction pattern already. The reason we cannot go to the second part, which is the, you know, the second bump, is because of the electron being, or the proton being a composite object, the peaks are very much highly smeared. So we know the technique, we know what is we are looking for, diffraction. We will do this very precisely. We have simulations which I will not show, but this is the cross-section of E gold over EP with saturation and this is the cross-section without saturation. You see, the differences between them are massive. So think about it, that 30% of the third of the time a TV G, uh, electron beam does not, is unable to destroy a nucleus which is only built with some KEV or MEV energy. That's a fascinating thing. Okay, I go to my last part of my presentation, realization. So this plan, this collider, got the highest recommendation for construction. So we recommend high energy, high luminosity polarized electron ion collider as the highest priority for new facility construction following the completion of the FRIB. FRIB is a, is a facility for radio isotope beam, uh, uh, which is being currently built at, uh, at uh, MSU. So that's an ongoing project. As soon as that gets done, the construction part of the nuclear science money should go to a new facility. And that's what the recommendation says, that this is what we want to build in the US beyond FRIP. There are theory and detector uh, uh, R&D and uh, accelerator R&D initiatives that were coupled to that. And those were also uh, uh, recommended. And we started getting money at the level of about $1.5 million uh, since uh, about 2011 through some back channels. But we are expecting to go formally to about $4 million soon. Uh, same thing for accelerator science this year. They've allotted for a realization plan of the machines, about $7 million per, per year. Of course, once we get to that level, we started forming collaborations. Those collaborations are rather uh, loose right now. We have formed a user group, and there are about 730 collaborators from 29 countries. This is 
the distribution of them. Um, it's, it's, it's not surprising that we have a worldwide support for this project because experiments that people have been involved with at CERN, at DAISY, at uh, Jefferson Lab, at SLAC, at Brookhaven, all of these users who have studied hadrons and, and cold QCD matter want to go in that direction because some of them, maybe not completely the same questions, but independent questions came up. And here is a facility, a single facility, that can address all of those questions. So I think this is, this is not surprising to us, but we want to grow to about three times larger in the user community for about 2,000 is what we are aiming for to run two experimental facilities fully in such a collider. And that's about possible. It's about 3,000 nuclear scientists in the US itself. So I think we can, we can do this. Um, if you look at the distribution, about 46% of the current users are US. The rest of them are, are European and Asian and some parts of the other parts of the kind of other world. So I think there's an international project is clearly there. We're going to meet, uh, we started meeting every year. The next meeting, you're invited at Catholic University of America, Washington, D.C., uh, August, uh, July 31st to August 4th. Now, the detector concepts that are evolving, let me comment on one particular one. Uh, to start with, here is a detector that has grown out of our Phoenix detector that is now being converted into a super Phoenix detector. It's a central barrel that is shown in blue here. And the idea would be that this is, this is being built for nucleus-nucleus or proton-proton collisions. In the future, we can add an asymmetric part. We can add a hadronic part in the nucleus going side and the electromagnetic part of the electron going side and build something called e phoenix detectors. Use everything that is being invested now for a short-term program into the future. So that's one aspect that we are exploring. Of course, we are also looking at a greenfield detector. If you wanted to build an ideal detector from scratch without respect to cost, what would you build? And that was a design that has come up with Brookhaven's Electron A Solenoidal Tracker called the Beast. We may change the name, but okay, well, that's, currently that's what it is. A very similar idea has evolved at Jefferson Lab. You can see they are very, very similar. Uh, but at Jefferson Lab, they have looked at the details of the, of the interaction region, et cetera, are different, but the physics being the same, it's not surprising to us that a separate group of people have, have come to the same basic design criteria. And then there's a last uh, uh, proposal that is coming up from Argonne National Lab, where they want to build a, they, a, a high energy physics group that are, that are getting involved. So the concept of particle flow detectors based on silicon tracking with precision calorimetry is something that they are building. But these are all proposals at the level of ideas. And there's a lot more to be done and a lot more precise information. So there is a lot of opportunity for new groups to come up with new designs. It doesn't have to be these four. So I think this is going to evolve over the next few years. What is the realization? What are the hurdles left for this? Whenever you have a facility which goes about $700 million plus, which is probably what it is going to be, about a billion dollars, uh, we, the DOE wants an independent approval from someone else. And that someone else is the National Academy of Sciences that have been reviewing us for the last one year. We have been going, visiting them for various presentations of the science and technical issues. We are told that the results of that review will come out in two months. So we are very close to that, so that process. After that comes out, assuming that the result is positive, the recommendation is made that this needs to be done, and our the nuclear science long-range planning uh, recommendation is supported, the Department of Energy will start the CD process. We expect a CD zero process in FY19, before FY19, which is really the next six months to eight months, we expect that DOE will accept this as a formal project to start building. And then there are things that are constraining the budget but we think that there is a viable path of reconstruction facility start. There are lots of hurdles that go from 2019 to 22, but a construction start of 23 is not completely out of question. And then the question is about $125 million a year for construction. It's a five-year construction. And that's why I think that there is a reasonable uh, uh, path for a realization to have collisions in about 10 years from now. And that assumes certain things that we were, you know, we had assumed. So, in conclusion, 
we believe, and I think we have convinced a lot of people in nuclear QCD science, that it will, EIC, with its precision and control, will profoundly impact our understanding of QCD. We really want to understand details of what quarks and gluons do inside the nuclei and nucleons, and how do they build the visible universe that we have. The three-dimensional structures, the imaging of quarks and gluons separately, this is really new thing. I told you that the electron-ion collider, the machine itself is a daunting task. It pushes the boundaries of our knowledge of accelerator science, and that's why it has become a magnet for accelerator physicists to get involved with. So there is a worldwide effort to help, including CERN accelerator physicists working with Brookhaven and Jefferson Lab accelerator scientists to really get to this because they see that certain technologies in them might be useful for future colliders that people will build around the world. The user group has been formed. It is a seed for detector collaborations. A positive academy review, April this will critical, will, will have the uh, uh, impact and that it will start the DOE process. And I think we are looking at an exciting times for all scientists. And particularly I want to uh, mention the younger researchers who when this actually operates might be in charge. Comments, criticism, all welcome, not just questions. They don't have to be identical. Typically, if you experience uh, from Hera, H1 and Zeus, which had the same acceptances but different technologies at, at the core. One used, for example, tracking with silicon ID. The other one used a, 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 a gas detector in the, in the early part. Over the years, they compared and competed. But now that the runs are over, the best results come when you combine those things because the systematic control over those precisions become very tricky to be solved in one detector. So you can do better with two detectors. Now, though that's a costly expect, uh, expectation. So I think the reality might be that we will start with that Phoenix detector which is constructing now for a different program. We will build the forward and backward part and that would be ready for day one on this electron ion collider. And Four years down the line will be the new detector, which will come at the other interaction point, which will be the more coherent one, or more complete one. At that point, when that becomes available, we would have run ePhoenix for about five to seven years. We would have learned quite a lot about, I mean, some of the early questions that I asked about nuclei and including spin would be already addressed very, very precisely. At that point, we would ask a question, now, if I went to upgrade, am I going in the same direction to upgrade the first one to make it comprehensive? Or did I miss something in QCD? Which is what we did at HERA, right? We missed the fact that there was very, very slow, small angle forward physics, that diffraction existed. We, we missed out on a lot because we did design the detectors right. We didn't know physics existed that close to the beam pipe in the very forward direction. And we can correct for such mistakes by going this phase wise. So my hope is, my idea, my, my vision for this, is that we start with this something called E Phoenix detector, which would go very well for 60 to 70% of the physics that I described to you. Then you build the comprehensive one because there's a large community behind it. At that time, the luminosity will also grow of the machine, so all the exclusive processes become available and diffraction. So that will start a program by itself. It will be complementary to what was done. And at that point, we decide whether the first one has to grow into the big one with complementary technology, or should we just build something small and improve something a little. So I think that's, those are, that's the play that I see going between those interaction regions. Having one collider detector operate at a time for at least certain time has some distinct advantages. Because at this high parton densities in the beam, the electron and the proton, they evaporate each other. There's a beam-beam effect. That, uh, so just by collisions, you're evaporating the other beam. And there are things that we need to worry about and work on, cool the beam, et cetera, et cetera. Those technologies really come on to you know, become very, very critical for such things. So all these things will be 
you know, which have to be developed, we have to be tested, we have to be implemented over time. And so the whole picture sits in my mind that way. This will be a four, four, four to five year uh, incremental picture where you'll be doing science at the same time you'll be learning the machine and the detectors. So that's the picture I have. I don't know whether I've clarified the role of the two detectors, but I think this is what we think will happen. You saw that there was a this bow tie. Nobody asked me why the bow tie collider. No, have, have you seen? I mean, maybe there is a bow tie shaped collider in Riverside somewhere that people didn't ask. That's the standard question I get anyway. Why is there a bow tie? Well, uh, to ask, you know, no matter how you slice it, it's a replacement cost of rig. You have to have a hadron ring and the electron ring, a tunnel. So the cost of that is going to be about two to three times larger because that's what it takes to replace RIC today. If you were to replace RIC today, it would be $2.2 billion by itself. Uh, and that's sort of what you would expect. Yes. No, no, no. It, it will, the National Academy of Science has been given a charge to review the science case. Is it worth building in the US? It will not distinguish between the design. Now, there are subtle things to that question. I don't know whether you ask them knowingly or unknowingly. I'm being recorded, so I, I have to be careful. Um, the, the bow tie shape comes because of a particular requirement for polarized deuterons in the ring. Um, when you accelerate a proton to high energy with polarization, you need something called Siberian snake magnet. The, normally, when you accelerate something, there is a field gradient in the, in the accelerator, and the proton precesses around it as it goes around. And when the precession frequency and the revolution frequency become integral multiples, there is a depolarization that happens. There's a resonance and depolarization happens. The polarization can be get improved. The alignment of the magnets over the entire collider can also be a very important factor. At RIC, we have achieved something like 150 microns over 3.8 kilometers. We know where the beam is. Within, or, or the magnets are within 150 mi microns, all magnets together. So every time there's a misalignment, the proton can, 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 can split, lose a little bit of polarization. And the Siberian snake magnet overcomes that effect by doing a very simple trick. It says it sits in some region, in the fixed region of, of, the, of the collider, and when the proton goes to, it's like a dipole magnet. Think about a dipole magnet. You hold one end of the dipole and twist the other. So that means the field is positive in this, and then it turns over, and when it comes out, it's 180 degrees around. So now think about what happens in, a, in the picture of depolarization. A proton goes through a depolarizing resonance, and it loses the polarization by, by five degrees, let's say. Then it goes through that Siberian snake magnet. Now it has gone down 180 degrees. Then it comes around back, now it has come back in the wrong direction, or the right direction for me, wrong for the physics. Now it gets a kick in the other direction, the same kick that it got the previous time. So on an average, over billions and billions of turns, these Siberian snakes, they do this and bring you back, do this and bring you back. So over time, it actually preserves. Now the problem. If you do that for deuterons, the magnetic movement being so small, this is very difficult. You'll need a five mile long Siberian snake instead of a 20 meter one, because the proton is you know, much more handleable in that sense. So a clever, clever accelerator scientist came with this idea. You take a ring, you hold one side, and you flip it. What do you get? You actually look at the mathematics of it. It's actually a snake. And then he said, I can inject the deuteron in that, and the whole ring becomes the Siberian snake. So I don't need any other Siberian snake. Absolutely brilliant idea. We've never tested it yet. But there is no reason to believe that I don't, that they don't understand QED. That's the calculation. That simulation shows that it will, will preserve it. So I actually believe it. This will actually happen. It has to be tested in a small part, which hopefully we'll do. But these are brilliant science, you know, excellent, beautiful idea. And it seems to work. I mean, it, it will work. I, I have a feeling it, it will work. So that's the reason for this. So it's untested, but it's 
If it works, it will be absolutely fantastic. There will be new ideas for uh, polarizing nuclei with very small uh, momenta, I mean, uh, angular momenta. 